Um, so George wanted me to talk about Odyssey, uh, and so I'm going to do a little bit about that. Um, but first I want to tell you a little bit of story about why I think this actually matters. Um, so 20 months ago, I was excited to have a new arrival in my family. Uh, Catherine was born, uh, and uh, we were excited for her arrival. However, uh, it was a bit of a bumpy start for Catherine. Um, she was born two months premature. Uh, soon after um, she was born, she was rushed to the neonatal intensive care unit, where we discovered she had cardiovascular complications that um, resulted in a month in the NICU trying to figure out what we're going to do to um, to treat her. And um, so 20 months ago was December. Um, so whereas everybody else was in the maternity ward celebrating uh, their new arrivals and celebrating with friends and family, um, there was only one exception to the fact that nobody could come visit Catherine. On Christmas, Santa Claus was able to come into the NICU and say hi to little teeny Catherine right there. Um, so one of the challenges we, that I got to face firsthand, and we were working on Odyssey prior to Catherine's arrival and thinking about it in very abstract terms about how observational data could help, it hit me right between the eyes that there's actually a lot in healthcare where we need evidence and patients deserve evidence to make good decisions about their healthcare, and yet that evidence just does not exist. Um, one of the benefits of having a uh, compromised child who's premature with cardiovascular complications is they, they offer you a lot of complex drugs to try to uh, make uh, uh, their entry into the world a little bit better. One of those drugs was this drug called Synergist, which was a drug to try to prevent uh, uh, RSV for reoccurrence of coming back to the hospital. And the thing is they gave me this pamphlet of information about this drug. Uh, and said, well, we really think you should give this to Catherine because it'll help and you don't want to come back to this hospital, particularly given her compromised state. Um, uh, but you need to read this pamphlet because there might be side effects associated with this drug. They handed me this pamphlet, not knowing anything about me or about the fact that I actually read these product labels for a living. Uh, and one of the things that uh, the doctor told me was, yeah, this paper says there's side effects, but don't worry, I've never seen any of them happen. So that was what the doctor told me. So the thing is, I actually did read that product label. And if you pull up the Synergist label, one of the things it says very prominently in the warnings and precautions is that Synergist, uh, that anaphylactics, uh, anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock and other severe hypersensitive reactions have been reported. And you should prematurely discontinue Synergist. Um, and also, by the way, it says there, this includes fatal cases have been reported. So here's the issue. Uh, I get this document that says, don't, my doctor says, don't worry, I don't, uh, I've never seen anything happen. Yet I'm given a piece of paper that says there's a chance that my, my child might die because they're going to take this treatment. And this product label, the thing that's approved by the Food and Drug Administration and provided by the product manufacturer, does not tell me whether anaphylaxis is going to happen in 1 in 10, 1 in 100, 1 in a million patients. And without that piece of information, I have no idea whether or not this is a good thing that's going to help my child or this is a bad thing that I need to steer clear of. Very basic piece of information, how often does the side effect happen, is not available to a patient. So um, I was given this paper and told tomorrow we've got to make the decision of whether or not we're going to inject this. So I did what uh, every concerned parent does. I sat in the NICU and I hacked code. So I, uh, I have the fortune of having access to a lot of different observational databases. And because those observational databases have been standardized using uh, the OMOP common data model and the Odyssey tools, I was able to perform analyses across a variety of observational databases to try to answer a very simple question, what's going to happen to Catherine? And one of the things that uh, you know, uh, George impressed uh, you by saying we have a data network that has access to 600 million lives, what that actually means is that we can create cohorts that are kind of unprecedented in size. Just in the data sets that I had access to while sitting in the NICU, I had access to over 5 million newborns. And for those 5 million newborns, I had multiple years of observation for those patients. So I had administrative claims and electronic health record data that told me about what treatments they had taken, what diseases uh, they, they had experienced, and what other health service behaviors they had. And so with access to 5 million children, I was able to go see, well, how many kids actually take Synergis? And I was able to find for newborns that actually I had access to over about 10,000 patients. 
Now that's two orders of magnitude bigger than the clinical trial that was used to actually approve that drug. And for those patients, I was able to just ask a very simple question, how often is anaphylaxis actually reported? And I was able to see that the rate of anaphylaxis was about 1 in 10,000 or so, depending on what particular population I was looking at. Uh, and I was able to see that um, actually the kids that had anaphylaxis in my data sets, none of them died. So I can probably safely expect that the rate of death is less than 1 in 10,000. Now, I performed this analysis as a concerned parent sitting in the NICU worried about what to do for my child. I was not performing this analysis uh, to try to publish a paper in Science or Nature, but the fact that I had to do anything to answer a very simple question of what's going to happen to Catherine is appalling and unacceptable. And until we actually do something to provide that evidence to, to patients, I think we all still have a res deep responsibility for what we do. So we left the hospital, we were able to actually get discharged, and I got home and got a whole set of drugs that I had to continue to administer to Catherine um, once we got home. And this is a picture of my uh, every two hour routine, trying to give these, these uh, injectable products to a little, little teeny baby. And of course, each of these products had their own profiles of what's going on with them. For example, I had to give her digoxin. Uh, and digoxin in the product label has this nice se section that basically says the safety and effectiveness of digoxin in children uh, has not been established. So I was given this to her and told that basically we don't know what to do, but you should know that newborn children display considerable variability in the tolerance of digoxin. So basically be careful with this thing even though we don't know whether or not it's going to work. Um, I was then also told to give her furosemide and in pediatric uh, children um, it was told that this drug might actually cause nephrocalcinosis, which is basically a renal disorder, uh, and not told again, is that going to happen one in ten, one in a hundred, one in a million? Um, I feel like I would like to know that information if, if I'm going to decide whether or not I'm going to treat my child with this drug. So I did what every concerned parent uh, would do. I performed an analysis to figure out what the rate of nephrocalcinosis was in furosemide children. And I was able to find across this wide array of databases uh, that I had access to over 1,400 patients who were newborns uh, exposed to furosemide. And I had a decent amount of follow-up for those patients. And for those patients, I was able to look to see what is the rate of uh, uh, renal disorders in general. I was able to see that's actually about 1%. That's not a trivial, trivial uh, rate. That's enough to tell me that, sure, I'm probably going to need to give this drug to my child since she has a cardiovascular complication. Um, however, I'm going to be paying very close attention to all the signs and symptoms of renal complications that might happen. But the issue is that I'm, as a concerned parent, I'm not interested in the one side effect that the product label happened to tell me about and whether or not it happens. I deserve to know what's the side effects, or what, are, what is the possibility of every possible side effect. And Catherine, while she's very, very special to me, she's not unique. Every single patient and every single child deserves to know every single piece of information about every treatment that they're going to have and whether or not those products are going to provide benefit to them or whether or not they're going to have a side effect. And the fact that we're sitting on data and yet I have to hack code to answer a simple question that we should be, have available, I find to be unacceptable. So uh, prior to Catherine's arrival, I would have said, oh, Odyssey is this cool open science community. George is leading. We are build, building a network. What I'll tell you is I think this is fundamentally what is necessary to change the paradigm of healthcare. We need to generate reliable evidence about treatments and medical interventions that we can put in the hands of patients so that they can make better decisions about their health care. We're doing that by developing a lot of cool informatics things, but much like the, the quote that Lee pulled up that you know, NLP is not the end game, that's the means. Uh, informatics and analytics is not the end game for Odyssey. The end game for Odyssey here is that we want to have a data network to generate evidence so that we can improve care. And that's very much what the mission of Odyssey is, trying to improve care by empowering a community to collaboratively generate evidence. So George showed this picture. Odyssey is an international collaborative. We have um, researchers, over 200 researchers from industry, academia, government, uh, working together in over 20 different countries. Uh, importantly, this is a multidisciplinary uh, 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 community, so we've got folks from epidemiology, statistics, and medical informatics, and other disciplines. And what I'd say is probably the most important thing that's going on here is that we're bringing different disciplines to the table to talk to each other, because it's very clear that we can't do all of this work from one silo alone. Um, and yes, we have uh, developed standards that are being applied to over 60 databases covering over two-thirds of a billion patients uh, with our goal of trying to have access to over a billion patients of data so that we can generate evidence to improve the lives of patients. 
So um, to show a couple pictures, though, um, this was our Odyssey Symposium that Columbia hosted in DC last year, where we had 400 uh, individuals from around the world come together. Um, uh, earlier this year, a couple of us went over to Korea thinking we were just having a little meeting, and it turns out that we walked into a massive building with these big banners talking about Odyssey Korea, and we walked into a, a room with 200 people sitting there waiting to be taught by us. And then as Chun Hua said, she's one of the people uh, in this picture where this little Odyssey China meeting just took place. What's happened that I think we've really touched a nerve is that people fundamentally believe that we should be doing the right thing for patients by generating reliable evidence, and people are willing to forego all the, the, the nonsense about oh, who gets the right grant and how can we compete with each other and say, let's work together to do what's right for patients. And I think we've really struck a nerve that we're all sitting on top of these data sources, but we could use them differently uh, to make a bigger impact in healthcare. And I think um, we haven't yet uh, achieved that goal, but I think we're making very good strides to do that. I'll also say uh, the Odyssey Symposium is next month in DC for many of you who are coming and those who might be on the fence. And if you are looking for that international travel opportunity, Odyssey Europe is now, they've scheduled a meeting apparently in March next year, which is very exciting. So this is based on the idea that we standardize our observational data to a common format that represents our clinical data, our health data, and this sits on top of standardized vocabularies or standardized uh, ontologies that we're able to impose across each and every data source across the Odyssey network. So everybody's uh, uh, entry here is that they've got source data. They uh, agree to uh, take their source data and standardize to the same OMOP common data model. And by having that as a community, we've developed a series of open source analytic tools that can be consistently and reproducibly applied to every data source and that generates evidence that we want to place in open repositories. So we can do this whether we're going to ask one question at a time or we can do this whether we want to be able to scale analytics to generate evidence across the host of problems that we think might be relevant to patients around the world. So the different types of things that Odyssey is doing, and I think there's a little bit of everything for folks that want to participate. We're conducting a lot of methodologic research to try to figure out best practices of how to standardize data and how to analyze those data to generate reliable evidence. We're developing open source software. So we're building tools that enable the community to execute analysis efficiently. And then we're trying to generate evidence to answer real clinical questions that matter. We specifically have been trying to focus on um, three different analytic use cases, and I'll, and I'll describe these and try to show you very briefly some examples of why we think these are important. Uh, clinical characterization, just understanding descriptively what happens to a, to a patient or to a population. Um, we recognize that there's a lot of just basic understanding of what happens to people who are exposed to interventions that is just not out there right now, that we feel like um, uh, standardizing that process could be useful. We're doing a lot of patient level prediction. Um, I, have heard, I think I heard the buzz term machine learning like six times already this morning. So we're doing machine learning too if you want to come hang out with us with that. Fundamentally the way that I want to shape that problem though is talk about um, going from what happened to other populations to actually be able to provide a personalized risk estimate of what's going to happen to me. And, and then we're doing a lot of work in population level effect estimates. So thinking about causal inference, either from the perspective of what are the side effects that a drug causes, or from a comparative effectiveness perspective, uh, is treatment A better than treatment B for a, for a particular outcome of interest? So uh, within Odyssey's area of focus, we have a lot of individuals who are doing individual research projects in either of those strategies or across the use cases. But fundamentally what we're trying to do is work as a community to conduct analyses across this spectrum to generate evidence that we think might be useful. And so I want to show you three quick examples uh, from each of these just to kind of whet your appetite about what we're up to. And certainly um, uh, this is collective work across many of the faculty here and staff. Um, and so many of us would be happy to talk to you later if you're interested. George mentioned very briefly, he's the lead author of a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where we asked a very simple question. We, we looked at specific diseases and we said, what are the treatment pathways that patients actually take uh, around the world? And so we were able to, this was one of our first Odyssey studies where we simply wrote up a protocol, posted it online and said, hey world, we'd love if you'd run this study. No strings attached, we didn't pay anybody, we didn't ask, ask any details, we said just run this study if you would. And we got results back from 11 different databases in four different countries. Uh, collectively this was a study of over 250 million patients. Uh, and we also conducted the whole analysis in approximately four weeks. Um, 
paper took a little longer to get published, but the actual work uh, was able to get done um, in, in remarkable speed, simply because people were excited by the idea of collaborating together. And so um, to motivate this specific example, there's lots of clinical guidelines that tell you what patients should be doing. So if someone's diagnosed with depression, how should they be treated? And guidelines say things like, well, you should think about patient preference, and you should think about the safety and tolerability of the drugs, and you should think about cost and these other considerations. We asked an even simpler question. What do patients actually get treated with in the world? And um, when we looked around this, uh, the Odyssey network, we were able to summarize what is the treatment patterns of patients with depression. What I'm showing you here is a sunburst diagram where the first circle represents the first treatment the patient ever took for depression. And if they needed a second line treatment, you're seeing in that, in that second line, third line, so on and so forth. And so if you're having like a psychedelic trip back there, because it's like a lot of colors, um, that's because there are lots of different treatment choices. And what we observed is lots of patients are making lots of different treatment choices. There is no one standard uh, treatment that's being used. What was even more impressive though, was we were able to look at that across different databases, different geographies, different healthcare systems to see whether or not we saw any sort of consistency and pattern. And, and the only constant we observed was variability. What we saw was if, if you're looking for the pattern across these databases, you can just keep looking, but we still haven't found it. Um, what we saw is that the choices that patients make, they vary by where the data is coming from, what the academic center is, whether or not we're in the US or somewhere else. One of the most striking findings that we had was you hear so many people talk about precision medicine and how we're gonna do analysis of patients like me. We're just gonna find your, your synthetic analog and you're gonna analyze those people. What we actually found was just based on treatment sequence alone, 11% of patients who were diagnosed with depression had a unique sequence of treatments that no other people across this entire network of 250 million patients had. So one in 10 depressed patients had a completely unique treatment sequence. So there ain't no patient like me for one in 10 patients with antidepressants. But we were able to take this same idea, this idea that we would like to look at treatment sequences, and we would like able to systematically apply it across different disease states. In this particular analysis, we didn't just do it depression, we also looked at diabetes and hypertension. But by taking this systems approach to the analysis, we developed tools that would enable anybody to study any disease they wanted. So rather than just thinking about the problem as, let's just do a one-off study of depression, we thought about how could we systematically analyze data to provide clinical characterization that might be relevant to support clinical care. So population level effect estimate. I'm going to depress you here just a little bit. Um, one of the challenges of a lot of causal inference work that's done in electronic health record data is that I'm not sure that we trust many of the results that we actually generate. Here's an example. At JAMA published this paper uh, back in August 2010 where they used an electronic health record data set um, from the UK to study whether or not bisphosphonates were associated with gastrointestinal cancer. And this study found that there was no significant association. So that's good. We can be at ease of that. Only problem was that one month later in the BMJ, a different research group taking the exact same data set found that uh, bisphosphonates were associated with uh, esophageal cancer. So one of these studies is wrong, but we don't know which one it is. And so collectively, we're left with refuting pieces of information, and probably we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, because we don't know how to trust this information. So the FDA created a system that is using US administrative claims data across the US called Sentinel to uh, be a stopgap and a tr uh, trusted authority of information from observational data to study side effects. And their first paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, looked, uh, and they issued a risk communication, looked at whether or not dabigatrin, which is one of the neural, uh, new uh, oral anticoagulants, whether it increased the risk of bleeding relative to warfarin. And their conclusion was, and their communication to the public was, uh, public, don't worry, this drug does not seem to increase the risk of bleeding relative to warfarin. This drug's pretty safe. There was a few clinicians who said, well, wait a second, I'm not so sure I trust that observational database, um, and actually suggested that this analysis is completely unsuitable for clinical care. <clears throat> and sure enough, a paper in JAMA came up a little bit afterwards that showed that that result that the FDA produced was completely opposite of the clinical trials. Um, that got us thinking, well, how, what can we trust in the uh, published literature? And so what I'm showing you here is an analysis that we've performed in Odyssey 
where we uh, extracted from uh, PubMed uh, effect estimates from uh, all the observational studies that we could find. Here's 60,000 of them at, at all. And I'll just orient you to this picture because you're going to see a couple of them. On the x-axis, I'm showing you the, uh, re the effect size. Think of that as the relative risk, where in the middle of the screen here is relative risk of one, meaning no effect. Uh, to the right of that would be an increased risk. To the left of that would be a decreased risk. On the y-axis, I'm showing you standard error. So think of that as how uncertain the published estimate was. There's a dashed red line that you see that looks like a V. That's our magical publishable threshold of P less than 0.05. So if a dot's below that, that line, uh, P is less than 0.05. If a dot's above that, that's a non-significant finding. So across all of the published literature that we can find in observational studies, you see a pretty damning picture here. What you see is that actually over 80% of published studies have statistically significant effects. They are skewed positively, so people are much more apt to report an increased risk than they are a decreased risk. You also see that lots of the dots hover right around that dashed red line. And this is the phenomenon that a lot of people are talking about is p-hacking, where people are just doing the analysis till they hit p less than 0.05, and then their faculty advisor says, good, submit it to the journal. Um, or, if, or in industry, we would do the same thing. The problem here is that I don't know if any of these studies are good or bad. Uh, some of these studies are probably giving us the right answer. But how in the world are we supposed to be able to decipher the ones that are in this picture that are good from the complete nonsense that this overall collective uh, evidence suggests? It can't be the fact that 80% of drugs are significantly associated with outcomes because we wouldn't ever take, we'd all just live in a bubble and not be exposed to anything if that were actually true. So we've been thinking a lot about how do we generate more honest evidence? How do we actually think about generating information that would probably be more credible and just at least pass uh, a face validity test for, for evidence? And to think about that, we've thought about the general process of generating evidence. So how did this happen? Well, each of us as researchers, we have an idea of a question. We go get some particular data source. We pick whatever analysis we want. We run the analysis on the data set. We wait till we get P less than 0.05. We write up a paper about that one question and we submit it to the journal. And this is the state of what we've done as a community as a result of that process. What if instead of us all doing studies one at a time, we collectively created a process in a system that could consistently look across multiple databases, applying a consistent analysis, not just to your one cherry-picked hypothesis, but instead to the compilation of whatever treatments are relevant and whatever outcomes might actually matter to patients. So we thought about what a system like that would look like, and we decided to implement it as a proof of concept. And so what I'm showing you here is, is the same plot but now, instead of this being published evidence, these are observational studies we conducted using a standard systematic process. And specifically, we looked at depression, and we looked at the 17 treatments that are out there for depression. We compared every treatment versus every other treatment for 23 outcomes that clinicians told us might actually be relevant to patients. And we conducted the same exact standardized analysis for each of those questions, and that resulted here in 17,000 studies. Now, each and every one of those dots is a fully, fully fledged study. We could publish it. We could publish 17,000 papers, and that would really help my CV, although it might not be uh, something we print anymore. Um, but what you see in this pattern is actually stark from what we saw in the literature. Now what you see is actually only about 13% of the associations are significant. You see that this picture is completely symmetrical. There's clearly no p-hacking going on. But instead, we now have a process that can generate information in a consistent way. So we're working right now to publish this. But not only are we writing a paper, we've actually created a website where the information from all 18,000 studies is publicly available. So anybody can go look for any treatment, any comparison, any outcome they want, and they can go look across this data network to see the answers to every single question. And we think this is going to be a paradigm that we're going to try to go beyond the paper to actually try to get the information and the evidence in the hands of patients. So, Okay, we've, we looked at all antidepressants and we looked at a bunch of outcomes and we saw this, but what did we actually learn? Well, we compared this to what already is collectively known about uh, antidepressants in the literature by looking at a meta-analysis of all the comparative clinical trials. And this interesting thing is that de depression is one of the most studied areas uh, around, and yet this, this meta-analysis actually summarized what do we actually know about the side effect of antidepressants. And there was a bunch of nuisance side effects where they said there's some evidence we know which treatments are better. Um, 
So for example, it's generally un understood that sertraline might increase the risk of diarrhea more than other um, antidepressants. But for most serious adverse effects, the current conclusion is that there's insufficient evidence from any source right now to know whether or not any of these treatments are better or worse for things like heart attack and stroke and seizures and liver failure. Um, one of them is suicidality. So every antidepressant has a black box warning that says um, the drug might actually cause uh, uh, suicidal intentions. And yet there is currently no evidence to tell us which treatment is better or worse. So we use this meta-analysis to first ask the question, can we confirm what was observed in clinical trials? And so just to illustrate one example, in sertraline, those clinical trials had hundreds of patients, and they all showed this increased risk of sertraline relative to other antidepressant treatments. We were able to completely replicate what was observed from those clinical trials, but instead of having hundreds of patients from the trials, we had hundreds of thousands of patients exposed from our observational data network. And our effect estimates pretty much were completely consistent. We are able to observe the things that we actually knew. What gets me more excited, though, is that this data actually can start to answer those questions that were insufficient from the clinical trials. So every drug has the exact same black box warning that says uh, antidepressants might cause suicidal intention with no information about which drugs are better or worse. Our data is at least providing us a, a compelling a hypothesis that potentially bupropion and amitriptyline have a decreased risk of suicidality relative to SSRIs. Now that's, that's something that we need to further validate and consider, but the fact that we're able to take this large data network and, and answer a question that has not yet been answered after two decades of work and hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of, of research is encouraging that this systematic approach could generate something useful. One last example, patient level prediction, or machine learning if you like that sexy term. So I want to show you how we can actually think about patient level prediction at scale and why I think that this actually matters. So within Odyssey, within the community, we've developed a standardized framework for how to think about prediction problems and how to apply them to data sets. And we've also built open source code that's just available for anybody to download and run against their own data. We took our population of people who were initiating depression treatment and we asked a simple question, can we predict what's going to happen to those people in the next year? And we applied that same panel of outcomes because those are the things that our clinicians told us matter to matter to their treatment choice and matter to patients. And so what we're able to do is apply different uh, machine learning algorithms across this network of data for all of these outcomes and try to figure out what can we tell a patient at the time that they're initiating treatment about what's going to happen to them in the future. And it turns out across those outcomes, many of them we couldn't predict so well, but there was actually a host of these outcomes that actually we got very strong predictive accuracy. So we got AUCs north of 0.8. Um, and that suggests that we can actually tell a, tell a patient something very specific, not just about what's happened to the general population, but what's going to happen to them. Um, so using that suicide example, let me just ground this into what this actually means um, and using some, some basic information. So in one of our data sets alone, we found that 5% of patients who are depressed um, and start a treatment, they're going to have a suicidal event or a suicidal ideation within a year. And so what I'm showing you here is 1,000 patients and 5% of those uh, patients who are going to have a suicidal event in the year. Our algorithm is able to predict 25% of those patients of who's going to have it using only 6% of the total population. So I've got 1,000 people. If you let me just pick 60 of those 1,000 people, I'm going to be able to find you a quarter of the people who are going to have suicidal ideation before it ever happens. At the time that I give them the treatment, we're going to be able to find a quarter of the people who are going to have a suicidal event. And of that 66 out of the 1,000 that I'm going to pick there, um, uh, basically one in five of them are in fact going to have the effect. So we've got a pr pretty reasonable positive predictive value. Now, the point here is that all I'm doing is I'm using purely phenotypic data from our EHR to identify some subset of population. It's not rocket science about what these risk factors are, but instead of saying, hey, by the way, this drug might cause suicidal ideation, instead now we can actually start answering the question of what's your individual risk? And you could imagine that if we could identify a small sub subpopulation that's actually at high risk for suicidality, maybe we'll do something about it. Maybe we'll intervene. Maybe we'll actually figure out how to monitor those patients more, sa more safely so that they have a better outcome. So um, how, how could you guys uh, help out with what's going on in Odyssey? So we need to figure out how to get reliable data to provide reliable evidence. And as it relates to my story about Catherine, I want to know where's the best data to answer questions about children. I want to know who are the patients that are actually exposed to drugs. I want to know, do drugs cause side effects? You know, does furosemide actually cause nephrocalcinosis in newborns? 
And I want to know, is my, pa my daughter, that patient who's just, just my little girl, is she going to be the one to develop a side effect? We need to do methods research to figure out how to do that. We need to build tools to do that. But most importantly, we need to answer these questions so that Catherine's not alone by having daddy sit in the NICU hacking code, but that every patient can have the information that's possible. I think that Odyssey actually can be the vehicle to provide this information. And I think that we're actually in a, uh, an exciting place right now where we're starting to have the best practices, we're starting to have the tools, and we're starting now to answer really interesting questions that I think are, are important. I saw a couple of the posters are going to talk about this, and I'm sure uh, in future conversations, if you have an interesting clinical question, please come talk to any of us who are working in Odyssey. Or if you'd just like to contribute to this cause, we'd really love to be involved. Catherine is doing great. She's very cute and special. Um, uh, but, I would, I, but I would say that um, if you can think about your research, not just as how you're solving an informatics problem or how you're building a tool, but think about how the work you're doing can actually impact the people around you that you love. Uh, at least for me, it's provided me a very high level of motivation to keep, this, uh, to keep this community going and to start doing work that I think can actually have real impact. So hopefully we're going to discover stuff and we're going to have impact through the Odyssey community. I'll stop there and take any questions if anybody has any. I just want to say, uh, you define the difference between biomedical informatics and computer science and engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.